Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine our show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Ben H., Uranium Aristocrat, Thomas N., Neil R., Michael G., and Carlos A. Back on the show, returning guest, Mr. Paul Gorenson is here with us. Paul is the Chief Executive Officer at Encore Energy, a U.S.-focused uranium explorer, developer, and near-term production-capable company with assets spread across Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Wyoming. Encore is a uranium portfolio holding at Smith Weekly Research. The company is listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol EU and also on the US OTC markets under the symbol ENCUF. Mr. Gorenson, welcome back to the show. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Doing very well. How are you doing? Well, we're hanging in there, Paul. We're doing okay. Uranium is interesting here. Some shiny objects being flashed in the market but yeah. uh, can't complain too much. And where are you talking to us from and how's life going? Well, I'm talking to you from South Texas today. I have uh, was down here to uh, do some work pre-planning for our capital projects uh, at Rosita and also to spend the Easter weekend with my family. So it's uh, things are going very well. Uh, as you may have heard in the news, Texas is 100% open for business now. And so, uh, it's a, a different environment than maybe some other places in, in the, the rest of the United States. Yeah, that's good and good for Texas. I'm glad to see some stepping out and, you know, states taking action and not following others. I think that that's a, a good bit of diversity here. Glad you're down doing some weekend work coming up here soon and happy Easter to you. Well, why don't you give us just maybe a two to three minute update on the company here as things stand today? Sure. You know, as we, we announced, we uh, we did that uh, significant uh, private placement last month. It was very successful. We oversubscribed, and I would say we probably had a waiting list that would allow us to be bigger if we if we had decided to. But it gives us a lot, an opportunity right now, uh, which is uh, key to us, is that as we brought on the uh, acquired West Water projects, uh, we got that completed, and uh, now we've started integrating them into our company. Uh, we got a, a good a good workforce. And uh, with the, the financing, we're starting to execute on our capital plans, uh, starting with Rosita and to uh, begin uh, configuring that back to uh, what I would call commercial production capable. Uh, obviously, we're not gonna put it into production right away because uh, the market currently is signaling that's the case. But we wanna get that, it's the low hanging fruit. so. Uh, it's something we can do right now and do it relatively inexpensively and relatively efficiently. Uh, we're also in the process of doing some evaluation work on some of the resources we acquired with uh, the Westwater transaction in New Mexico. We're updating some 43101 reports as well as uh, in Texas, we're doing some land evaluation, doing some acquisitions of uh, leases to uh, basically create a production resource to support production at uh, Rosita. Those properties and resources uh, will allow us to, you know, are, are well known enough that we would be able to put those into production according to our schedule. And fortunately, you know, with an existing license facility, this gives us the opportunity to be able to do this in a relatively quick manner. Governments always are involved, so nothing's ever for sure. And uh, not everything's in your control, but I've worked in Texas most of my career. And uh, I believe that uh, the it's something that we've, we've got a pretty good uh, idea on our timing, and it'll sync up with our, our, uh, our company plans, which is to be, have fully a well field uh, in order to support Rosita and everything ready to go by 2022, end of 2022. I think our timing's right, and uh, that, that's pretty exciting. Uh, I've met with the team. That we that came with the acquisition this week, and uh, they're young, but they're very excited to get out and do something. They want to conquer the world. Of course, that works right in you know kind of where our, we're at. And in addition to that, uh, we continue to uh, work on potential opportunities for mergers and acquisitions. Uh, 
as, as part of our strategy and we're continuing, you know, some of the work we're doing as well is to begin to uh, look at our long-term plans in New Mexico to uh, create the long-term future for the company. Uh, one of the other things I've been doing since January is meeting with util nuclear utilities to get a sense on timing for demand. And uh, also just to introduce Encore, as, as I think as our shareholders know, Encore has been a pretty low profile company until recently. And uh, as uh, with my joining the company, et cetera, we've raised our profile, but in truth, the, the nuclear industry doesn't know who we are. So it's time to get uh, to start introducing ourselves uh, with the expectation we'll start to see some activity on the term contracting side uh, that we'll be able to participate in. Been a full book. <laughs> Yeah, certainly lots of stuff going on. And, you know, you've got this small production base in Texas that can start out. You're getting there and the ISR component and know that there's a lot of potential with not only existing projects, but other stuff that you guys could do to also uh, improve your position from a production profile standpoint over the next couple of years. And good to see you guys continuing to make progress where a lot of companies out there are really just churning the same old stuff sit here and recycle the paperwork, whereas you guys are actually making some good progress in this market. Um, so this 15 million, you know, speak maybe specifically to some of the plans with that capital here, Paul. And if you were to be conservative, how far will this carry the company until it is time to pull the trigger on development and pre-production if we have a marketplace that remains stagnant through the rest of this year and maybe even into uh, early next year? If we did absolutely nothing, we could probably, you know, we do have a carrying cost now that we acquired the Westwater assets. There's no doubt about that. Assuming we did nothing but just maintain what we have right now, we probably could, the 15 million would last us about three years. If uh, we do our plans that we plan to execute upon, that is the, the build out at Rosita, as well as doing some additional drilling and acquisitions, uh, we're talking about two years. And uh, I know that doesn't sound like a big difference between three to two, but one of the things I've learned in the past is that you don't do everything, you don't go out and gold plate everything to begin with. You do things in increments, but also you do them in a, in a manner that uh, uh, you can manage your costs the best. So you're not taking off too big of a grab to where it's like the monkey holding the, the food, trying to get out of the cookie jar. You know, you just can't let go at that point. I want to make it to where it's small enough bites to where if I have to, if the market doesn't, you know, when I talk about market, I'm talking about uranium markets, not equity markets, but if the uranium market doesn't respond like we expect it to, we have the ability to cut, to uh, extract ourselves from what we're doing and, and maintain what we have. And so I've learned that lesson from many ups and downs in the, in the uranium industry. I think this is, would be my fourth cycle I've been on. I've seen people handling it very well and others not handling it so well. So I'm doing my best to be as prudent with what we're doing so that, uh, I don't have to go make really difficult decisions at bad times. Well, Paul, it's good to hear you're not spending the money on finished goods like cake in a can, as I believe, as you do, that that capital is spent much better on other activities, specifically key activities uh, that can mm -hmm. actually return even better than that. You know, you guys do have some warrants that are in the money. It's always possible that those could come in early at this point, given where the share price is. And then on top of that, too, if the market conditions merit and the performance of the company continues to do well, then obviously it makes sense to maybe unexpectedly raise some additional capital that could be pre-production capital to get ready to uh, to do some stuff at Rosita and, and other places. So I think that makes sense. Well, look, last time you came on the show, you were at Energy Fuels. And boy, I tell you, that was uh, close to a year ago, maybe more. I don't remember, but it was quite a while ago that we spoke. Of course, Energy Fuels, you were with our mutual friend, Mark Chalmers. Why did you make the move from Energy Fuels to Encore Energy? It's always, uh, when you when you get make big changes like that, it's always, a, a you know, sometimes you can answer the question directly or not. I, I will say that uh, my departure from Energy Fuels was, was a very amicable one. Uh, I talked to Mark Chalmers regularly by phone. And, and uh, so it was, uh, there's certainly nothing negative about that. It was just a, uh, it was a need to do a breach point in my career. It's time, it was just time to do something else. And uh, not for lack of, uh, you know, any disagreements or anything like that. It, it was uh, the energy fields reach a point uh, and their 
their strategy and I reached a point in my strategy and we both decided that uh, it worked for both sides favor that I go out and uh, see what I could do on outside of energy fuels. Uh, I will say that I enjoy working for Mark. I enjoy working for energy fuels. I think that uh, what they're doing these days with where and other things are exciting, but I've always been one that wants to get out and get my hands dirty in the field. And uranium has been my career, my life. And so, uh, this was the right move for me, and I think Energy Fuels is, a, is good for it as well. You know, the opportunity to work with Encore was, uh, wasn't planned, but it was an opportunity that uh, was serendipitous with our mutual decision, Energy Fuels. And so it, uh, it all worked out good. For, it's like it's the epitome of not necessarily having life handy lemons but, uh, and making lemonade out of it, but uh, I would say it was a, a way to make some really good lemonade when there really wasn't any sour lemons out there to catch that phrase. It was just, everything worked out just fine for everybody. Yeah. And here you guys are, uh, you coming on board. I think Bill would agree that uh, this adds a, a big piece of credibility to the company. It expands the company's capabilities, which I'd like to get to in a moment here. But uh, it also allows you to go out and work with a, a smaller company to build that up to compete with energy fuels and to compete with the UR energies and the peninsulas and the UECs of the U.S. domestic uranium space, which I think makes sense. And, and here you guys are uh, on the cusp of really competing with these companies now. And so I think that's also important to point out. Paul, let's talk about M&A for a moment. I'd like your thoughts on M&A from the standpoint of the cycle, the point where we are in this cycle and when it is most effective and why haven't we seen meaningful M&A so far during this cycle when I think you and I both agree that M&A makes the most sense early stage? Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. You know, the, the, the whole uranium industry has changed dramatically since the last run up into the early 2000s, mid 2000s. Uh, in the mid 2000s, uh, you you could have single project companies that could uh, form, you know, there was enough excitement and everything else, but what we've seen is uh, the market dynamics changed where you've got large state-owned enterprises out there that are able to uh, uh, compete on a large scale and actually uh, make the, the market, you know, well, where we're at today. But, uh, you know, you're, instead of competing just against uh, uh, the other U.S. competitors like uh, UR and, and Energy Fuels and everything, you're competing not against them, but against the Kazatom Proms, uh, the Uranium Ones, and the, uh, the Cameco's of the world, and also various other large companies. And so economies of scale are not, you know, there's a couple of things that you, you have to get your costs down to be competitive. And one of the things that's become very apparent in, to me is that uh, as you have smaller companies trying to, to get, you become small fish in a pond full of a lot of very big fish. And they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily eat you to get bigger. They, they, they take, starve you for food. In other words, uh, they starve you for revenue because they're able to go get all the business. And uh, it makes it very hard to have, and pardon the pun, in the uranium space, a critical mass to be competitive. And I see that uh, a, de a defined need to have consolidation in the space. There's a lot of very good projects out there. And there's a lot of very good, there's good people in the industry, but it's hard when, you're, when all you're doing is competing against yourselves, when truly on a global scale, we're actually competing against countries. So I see the need for uh, for M and A work to be able to strengthen the books of the company, strengthen the company strategy wise. I think now is the time to do it before things get to the the one thing that became very apparent in the last cycle was that uh, once companies actually started getting operations going and everything else, uh, they they were already behind the curve with respect to delivering into the market. The other thing is is that the industry's contracted significantly. And a whole lot of talent has exited the industry and gone elsewhere. And so you can have a great project and a great set of other properties as well. But if you don't have the means to get it executed, it becomes harder to be present in the, in the uranium market. And so I think one of the things that, like from my experience, you know, working with uh, Encore has been, that's what it's exciting about is because you have a management that uh, is experienced in, m a but now with me getting on board uh now we've got not only do we have a uh, experience in m a but we have experience in executing and i see that as as our strength and i think that uh 
with respect to uh, other companies, you know, I think that if we can get beyond some of the egos and, and the pride of ownership and everything else and look at uh, making the bigger picture, making a stronger combined uh, approach, everybody profits in the end, but we have to get beyond some of the short-term issues. Yep, certainly agreed. I think that the market will reward scale later on, maybe not now, and it will also reward good M&A movements in this market. And we've already seen that to some degree with a few transactions that have happened. Smaller stuff, you know, not stuff that necessarily moves the needle per se, although it really has in some of these equities and, and Encore is one of those with the Westwater acquisition. And so absolutely, if we can get past some of the egos and the prides out there, you and I both know that trying to do M&A mid, late stage, there's very little value left in that, certainly late stage. We saw that last period, last cycle, we saw a late stage M&A, which uh, didn't result in anything positive. Fully agreed here. And any sound operator knows that the early stage M&A makes the most sense from a value standpoint. And it's really just making sure that both parties see that. And that's the important part to see that the combined company, you know, it's more or less a two plus two equals six or seven uh, scenario. And that's absolutely true. And there's very few places you can do that unless you're at the bottom of a market or in a bear market or just coming out of that. I think that's where assets go on sale. That's one place where the uranium space has not necessarily saw that and had any people take action where you go over to the places like in the copper market, for example, or in the gold market, you saw a lot of M&A happen for absolutely stupid cheap prices during 2015, 2016, and even into 2017, 2018 even. Just some fantastic moves that will absolutely be rewarded later on in this market. Well, Paul, there's also been some voices out there on social media and elsewhere bringing doubt to the legitimacy of the company capabilities What's your thoughts on that? And perhaps it's been self-serving for the parties who have been saying that, but what would you say about that? Well, first of all, I wouldn't have taken a job if I didn't think it was a serious, had serious opportunity and, and uh, going forward. I like to think I have a reputation of being able to deliver success and I, I wouldn't have you know, taken a job if I wouldn't have thought I could uh, deliver success to Encore and its shareholders. So I'll get that out of the way. With respect to Encore itself, you know, it, it's been, it's been very quiet, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there wasn't much activity. The assets are they're kind of, you know, spread out in different locations. Uh, but the, the key thing with, that I see with the, the Westwater transaction brings is that it, it brings some uh, near-term production capability. Uh, will I say it has, world, the, the, in Texas, we have world-class deposits. I'm not gonna go say we do, but I do believe we can execute our plan and deliver uh, uh, production on our schedule, and uh, and that leads to bigger things. Uh, the uh, I see a tremendous opportunity uh, with the company. Uh, I think that some of the uh, the people who have doubts about what we're get, what we're able to do, uh, you know, I'm not going to go and get into you know a battle with them on opinions. Everybody's got their opinion, but I think that I've taken the approach is that I can't go I can't go and say I can deliver. How about if I just deliver first or we deliver first? But I think it's about delivering results. You know, maybe you can get faith in us now. And if we execute our plan and deliver on doing what we say we're going to do and not over promise, that'll help take some of the skept convert some of the skeptics into uh, uh, supporters. And that's the way I see it. And I, I think that Doncor is perfectly set up to do that. The company, Bill Sheriff and others have done a great job of getting getting the company into a position uh, where we're at now. And uh, I got a lot of faith that uh, not only will we deliver on production results, but I think we'll make a, we'll have a, have a story that people will, will really like going forward and actually have real results. I, I don't, I believe in uh, delivering on what I say I'm going to do. And uh, I certainly don't want to, you know, I'm doing my best to assure that we're not over promising on that strategy. You know, it's funny, some of these actors out there that uh, say these things about certain companies, they're talking out of both sides of their mouth, Paul, because they're also involved in companies that are absolutely have no legitimacy whatsoever. <laughs> and it's nothing more than a promotional act. I have to chuckle. We see these different things come out and these different people who, you know, promote one position, promote this or promote that. And, you know, all while, you know, we don't necessarily, and I think you can attest, 
we don't say much of anything about our positions. Yeah. You know, sh shut up and watch the party being humble about your positions here and also having a strategy without uh, coming in and trying to pick apart one company or another company. Yeah, certainly interesting, uh, this piece of it and how people get uh, very emotional about uh, different points on different companies here. But let's shift over here to another topic. This was one that a couple audience members have talked about and asked about, which I think it's very simple to resolve. But what are your thoughts where those initial big volume long-term contracts come in? Do you see it coming from price reporters? Do you see it coming from an announcement? Or do you really see that these long-term deals just show up in financial reporting? Because some people are concerned about the disconnect, about these contracts happening behind the scenes. But as you know, eventually these contracts have to come out and have to be disclosed at some point somehow. What's your thoughts there? Well, it depends on the company and, and the, 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 the reporting requirements. So for example, let's say uh, in our situation, because we're on the venture exchange, we have certain reporting requirements where if we did a long-term contract, we would probably have to announce, describe it, uh, at least publicly, uh, simply because it's so significant on a materiality basis. But you get into some of the larger companies, uh, they don't have to disclose it because it may or may not, it's in a normal course of business. And uh, so their need to disclose or uh, becomes uh, less of a regulatory requirement. And then it becomes a decision whether it's something that you need to be promotional about. What you'll find in, in the case of a lot of companies, and, and I've worked for several, is that you're going to have to, to find out the terms of what the term agreements are, is you're going to have to dig through the financials and, and kind of back calculate it. And the reason why is because if you've ever dealt with these transactions like I have, uh, there's a whole lot of confidentiality on it. Timing, pricing, the counterparties and where the deliveries are, uh, some of them are, are to be determined later and others are and others are strictly confidential. And so you get into that balancing act as to what you can and can't report. I think most smaller companies will, will say they have term contracts and give general terms about it. Uh, but uh, when you get into larger companies, say the, the chemicals of the world, it becomes a, it's just a normal course of business and they don't, there's no need for them to be reporting. And for them, they don't need it to announce everything. Uh, so it gets, it, it just depends on kind of what the company's needs are and what the regulatory requirements are. I think, if, for example, if down the road, say we had a large book and we're delivering into several different contracts, and I'm only, spec this is strictly hypothetical, maybe we wouldn't be disclosing all the terms, but if we're just delivering under one, that's the only one we have, then it becomes more difficult, one, to effectively, you know, use the financials as a means to, to kind of report without reporting. You, you need to suddenly become a little bit more transparent on what those things are. I, I know from the, uh, the the shareholder or from the, the just the person, the average uh, member of the public trying to understand what these things look like, it becomes a bit of a detective work. It's just the nature of the way things are. Even if one were to do a spot deal, you would be, you could probably announce what the price is and general timing on when the delivery is, but uh, you couldn't disclose who the counterpart, likely couldn't disclose who the counterparty is or or even the location where it's going to be delivered. It just becomes a, uh, you get wrapped up around the axle on some of these disclosure issues. But any company who's following what they're supposed to do, you should be able to, you know, from their financials, be able to ferret that out until obviously there's so many transactions happening. It becomes invisible just from the, the trees become noisier than the forest. To wrap that up, I think it really comes down to eventually the, the price reporters that will flow through eventually. Mm -hmm. And to not sweat it, because like you said, and like I know, and everybody else should know, this will show up in the financial reports. So you yeah. don't need to worry about, will it stay secret forever? Absolutely not. And then when that time comes, when there's so many contracts taking place, the big volume contracts is what I'm concerned with. Big volume yeah. contracts start taking place. At that point, a lot's gone well in this market. So you don't need to be worried too much about it, because mm -hmm. eventually it will come through with price reporters. And again, the financials is the only thing that matters as long as you follow the financials, which will trail, but they'll come in yeah. and you'll be able to see how that's happening. And so announcement or not, irrespective, the big key is just pay attention to the financials and you'll be okay. You don't need to sweat it. Talk about jurisdictions here for a moment. How would you pursue further expansion into Wyoming here, Paul? 
as you guys look towards, uh, you know, maybe more stuff in Wyoming potentially, would you guys look at a move that would include an ISR facility in the future? Would you guys expand further into Wyoming? I know you have some projects there now. And then what would you guys do from a production standpoint in the future? Well, uh, focusing on Wyoming, first of all, uh, as I think most people know, I, I spent a lot of my career, you know, I, I talk about Texas a lot because that's where, you know, I spent most of my life, but uh, spent a significant amount of time up in Wyoming. And, and uh, one of the things I did back when, you know, before when I worked for Canico and then with your honors and energy fuels was push to uh, get the federal government out of the decision making process and licensing. Uh, and the reason why I did that was because Wyoming having great resources and uh, a, a very solid state to do business in, a great state to do business in, uh, the federal process was burdensome. It was long, it took a long time and it was very expensive. And when I speak of that, it's for the, from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And, and having come from uh, states like Texas, where the te state of Texas is the ultimate regulator for uranium mining uh, and, and production, uh, it's, it's based effectively one-stop shopping. You're dealing with one agency. It's local. You can drive. If you've got an issue with, a, with a, the licensing process or whatever, you can go, to, go directly to Austin, Texas and deal with it. And when I started... You know, I've worked in Wyoming several times through my career, and one of the things that became very clear, as long as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was regulating it, not to, to besmirch their staff or anything, it's just their processes and everything else, it was taken five to six times longer uh, than it was in an agreement state, and it was costing 10 times more. And the other thing is, if you had an issue, you had to go to Rockville, Maryland, not to Cheyenne, Wyoming which uh, anybody who knows Wyoming, Cheyenne's about as far away as you can get from any place in Wyoming where the business is, just by the nature of how the state was, uh, became a state, a territory and state. Nonetheless, is that, uh, you know, it became very important. Let's, and so I led an effort uh, to, to drive Wyoming to become an agreement state. I got a lot of, a lot of the, everybody in the industry was on board with that. It took a bit to get it started and then became uh, we got a lot of support out of the, the legislature, and the governor was very supportive of it, and we got it done. And now, you, as you've seen some from out, some of the other companies, whether it's your energy or Peninsula, you've seen that, that they're getting, you know, the, the timing to get licensing and, and, and permanent activities has accelerated significantly, so making Wyoming much more competitive. And, and when I say that, I, I, it's, it's an important statement to say Wyoming is much more competitive than it was because... In the last cycle, the Texas operations in the U.S., that's where you saw all the production growth is in Texas. Wyoming had the biggest opportunity, the biggest investments, but they came on later. Actually, a lot of them didn't even start up until well after Fukushima. The Fukushima incident occurred, so it, it put them behind the curve, so they missed out on the peak. And so that was a... Uh, that's why I see, you know, Wyoming and, and Texas as being the best place to go. And, and we do have properties in Wyoming. They haven't been, we haven't fully evaluated where they place in a potential production uh, plan. That's the next iteration that we're doing because I see Wyoming as, as another opportunity for growth for Encore. We talk about Texas, we talk about New Mexico because that's where our assets are. But I see Wyoming as an opportunity for, for growth as well. Whether we do it organically or through M&A, uh, I think it's, it's a great opportunity. I have, uh, you know, there's, I, I have a lot of, you know, I know where all the projects are up there. I know, I know the, uh, the properties fairly well, uh, but I see the political environment in Wyoming is very supportive as well. And uh, when you talk about jurisdictions uh, in the U.S. side, having uh, assets in what we call agreement states is a big plus because it accelerates your ability to, it puts everything in the state control. Where there's issues, the only place where there's issues in Wyoming is where you have significant federal ownership of surface. Minerals are okay, but it's the surface estate uh, where you have to go to the Department of Interior and Bureau of Land Management. Uh, particularly with the new uh, administration, it's still unknown territory as to what that's going to be. But uh, where you have state leases and, surf and, and private surface, Boy, it's a it's a great opportunity, and even on the federal side, I mean, it's manageable. It's not certainly not what it, it was when the NRC was in charge. 
from Encore's perspective, I see Wyoming as an upside opportunity for us. Agreed. I like it too, and it's a good place to be in. What are your thoughts on Nebraska? You know, it's a place that I often forget about. What do you think? Does Nebraska have any future here for uranium mining? Um, and do you guys have any interest there? I actually had an opportunity to work in Nebraska because I worked with Cameco and, and was in charge of the, 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 the Crow Butte operations as part of my portfolio. I, I find that Nebraska has great opportunity. There's good resources there. Good resources haven't been exploited yet. What's hampered Nebraska to date is the fact that there's only been one operator, which has been Crow Butte. It's been tougher to get a foothold in it because uh, the, the the company, you know, obviously Cameco through its uh, long-term ownership up there has been able to uh, control a lot of the, the properties. But I think that the state is very favorable for uranium production. They are still a, a non-agreement state, so that means that they have, the NRC does the regulations, but that could change. They have all the rules in place. They just haven't activated them yet because the state decided that uh, way back uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago that they weren't going to burden uh, uh, one project with the, the load for the entire uh, regulatory environment. And But now with uh, more fewer companies into the NRC world, you know, there may be an opportunity there. But I see tremendous upside. Uh, first of all, the it's all private land. Uh, the mineral resources are well understood. Uh, there's there's opportunity that the state is experienced in regulating in situ recovery, and almost all the, uh, the the resources are in situ. And with the, the performance that you've seen out of the Crow Butte operation of safety and environmental protection and production, I think it's created a, a favorable view of uranium mining there. Now, there's always going to be public members who are opposing of uranium mining for a lot of reasons. But I think from a perspective of, uh, of uh, project risk, I see Nebraska being there. And it always gets lost on the radar because uh, unless you've worked for Cameco and you, or, or worked on the Crow View project, it doesn't come into your, you just don't see it all the time. Uh, whereas, you know, you've got a lot of players in Wyoming, a lot of, and Texas as, and New Mexico and other places where there's been a lot of people who've worked in those environments and everything. And the, the challenge, the, the, the issue with Nebraska is that there's been one project and that's all anybody's ever seen. And that's a very select group subset within the entire uranium space in the United States. And uh, But I do see opportunities. I haven't looked at, like you, I, I haven't looked at Nebraska from an Encore strategy, but certainly I wouldn't exclude it. Uh, it's certainly, there's some opportunities there. But, uh, you know, you can only do so much with limited people and limited capital. <laughs> yes. Nebraska certainly has some potential and, uh, you know, there's even interest in places like Oregon, which would uh, almost never happen yeah. <laughs> in, in this environment. So it, let me tie that back in because you mentioned Cameco. Uranium One and Cameco, really, their assets in the U.S. are really non-core to their business. Yeah. And you know their assets. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on those assets? And do you think that uh, Encore would have any interest in either Cameco assets or Uranium One assets here? I'll answer that with a yes, and uh, then I'll qualify. <laughs> Excellent. It all depends on the terms of the, the acquisition, but yes, they, they've got good quality assets, both of them do. Each one has, uh, their, there's always issues on everything, right? And and some of it's uh, uh, decommissioning liabilities and being able to pick it up. And so they both have liabilities associated with them, and, and you have to be willing to take on those liabilities to, to get the upside for the assets. Both of them have a lot of upside, and having physical processing facilities with experienced workforce is a, is a big, big plus. And I know both of those companies' assets very well. Uh, I would say that uh, all of them, all of the above interest me, and uh, it's just a matter of getting to a place where you can get to terms uh, on those. And they, they, as you know, Cameco's put them up for sale in the past. And uh, that all came to basically a stop, you know, when your energy and energy fuels kicked off the 232 investigation. And uh, I would say that uh, if someone came in with the right offer that uh, you probably could get Cameco's attention again, but I'm not sure. There's certainly no incentive for them to do a yard sale, so to speak, and sell up small assets. I think in both cases, you'd have to be looking at the entire transaction being the entire company, you know, those assets. 
Yeah, interesting stuff there, and we'll see what happens uh, in the future there. But definitely to the both of those companies, you know, it really seems to be not core at this point. And their pipeline strategy is at this point undefined. We mm -hmm. haven't seen a lot of activity coming out of those companies uh, when, in fact, we would say that they should have looked at some assets and should be looking at some assets here to grow their pipeline. But that apparently does not seem to be in their view. Um, coming back to Texas for a moment, let's get your view here. And I know you guys are working on this. But talk about how you guys are going to grow your presence and production base in Texas here. I mean, you have a very nice baseline. Expand a little bit more on what you said earlier. What's the plan with Texas here? You know, as, uh, if anybody who's uh, followed Encore for a while, uh, we have what's, you know, a large what we call database. And so, and I've brought in some experienced, uh, a couple of experienced geologists to, to uh, help out with uh, uh, the, the uh, planning. And, and and acquisition approach. So we we are actively leasing properties now, uh, and uh, and mineral interest to with within areas that have known resources. And uh, it doesn't take much. There's you know there's no real need to go out and do any greenfield exploration. The, the back in the 70s and 80s, there was tremendous amounts of exploration that was done in South Texas because it was seen as the upside uh, for some of these companies whether it's Conoco or Exxon or any of those, what we've been able to do is acquire the data and information on those properties. And right now we're in the process of exploiting that database, focusing on a couple of targets right now that have known resources on them and, and establishing those uh, in, as a future production and getting those into the licensed uh, uh, capacity of Rosita as well as we're looking at other projects to be to expand that out that uh, resource base that would feed Rosita. So it's a, we've got a strategy. Uh, the only challenge is keeping us from executing faster on it is bandwidth. And when I say bandwidth, it's just that I've got be judicious on how you know on how many people we bring, you know, hire, et cetera. So we're trying to I'm trying to manage the bandwidth of our our people to be able to uh, keep assessing properties. But I'd say we're very active on that. And it's getting pretty exciting. We've had some successes, I would say, and I, I can't go into the details, obviously, because they're private transactions. But uh, I can say we've been successful, and it's uh, it's exciting, and it uh, helps form up what I believe is our strategy going forward. And I do see future opportunities as well for bigger targets. That's the one thing that uh, gets. Uh, but we got to start a little to get. The production feed coming in for Rosita, so we can establish that of cash flow to do the other acquisitions rather than do, or or at least have the ability to support any financing through revenue to be able to support expansion to further projects. Because I think there's a whole lot of opportunity there. A lot of people don't realize is that Texas did produce historically produced over 80 million pounds of uranium, and a lot of that, about half of that's through in situ recovery. And then on top of that. There's just a tremendous amount of opportunities. The USGS has done some wonderful work on, on assessing, looking at all historic data and the historic NURI data, and there's just a tremendous amount of resources down there that provide a lot of upside uh, and opportunity. And then I'm not talking blue sky. I'm talking about near-term, you know, it, it's near-term uh, opportunities. And we're, we're working on that right now. It, like I said, it's pretty exciting for me. I, you know, we get good news every week that, uh, yep, we're we're on we're on track and and uh, I think that's an opportunity now. Like I said, uh, it's going to take a lot of work to build the critical mass to make this a long term. When I say long term, a big big enough uh, resource base uh, to where we could very likely operate both Kingsville and Rosita that's simultaneously. But I that's what we're working on. On the listed junior side. Encore and Laramide probably have the most New Mexico exposure. Talk mm -hmm. about the New Mexico pipeline for a moment. And do you see any interaction with Laramide in dealing with developments there in New Mexico? So the uh, with New Mexico, we see New Mexico as a longer strategy. There's a couple of reasons why uh, that, uh, but the main one is that, uh, you know, the legacy of historic uranium mining in, in New Mexico has created some legacy issues that have to be addressed uh, prior to uh, uh, getting, you know, for lack of a better term, as we work in the ESG environment, the, the social license to be able to operate. We could do everything right uh, on 
the, the regulatory side, but if we don't have the ability to uh, convince the, the local communities that we need to be operating, it creates an, uh, basically an uphill battle on the regulatory licensing. So we've taken the approach that uh, we need to do some inroads into the local communities, focusing on uh, the Navajo communities that are, are uh, uh, near where our projects are. And uh, we see that as a, you know, it's gonna be a bit of a time to do it, you know, if I talk about five years, uh, that's probably the right window, but it's to work not only with uh, uh, addressing some of the issues that, you know, supporting the, you know, you know, one of the things I've been very active on uh, with respect to the Navajo issues is to address a lot of the abandoned uranium mining claims. These are all federal responsibilities, but uh, working with alleged congressional staff and, and uh, both folks in the House and Senate side to, and in, in, the previous, in the previous administration, uh, to uh, drive the cleanup. There's, there's money available and to drive the cleanup for these because one thing I've learned working in a Navajo community is that no one's going to want to look at new uranium projects, or even, even even though they're off the reservation, but they don't even want them in their communities until we deal with the legacy side. And that's a lot of it has to do with just how the practices were done back in the 50s, the 60s, and 70s before a lot of the environmental and safety laws were enacted. But it's hard to convince anybody that um, that you can act responsibly until you've shown until what they see every day driving down the road or near their home is addressed. And so, and you know, you go, well, I've got, you know, I've got my license, I've got money, it's my project, I can do what I want to. But really and truly in that area, it's very, you know, it's, it's just, a, you, you've got to be aware of what's going on in the local tribal communities. And uh, uh, I think that's important. That's something we've looked at. We're looking at ways to, to provide opportunities for, uh, something more than just uh, a few couple, you know, a couple of jobs and maybe a park or infrastructure, you know, small infrastructure project or something like that in the local community as a means to get in, but creating true opportunities for the community uh, going forward. And there's some of the sense like uh, what we've seen up in Saskatchewan with some of the work that Cameco has done, as well as other places in the U.S. And so that's part of our strategy to give us that social license to operate in New Mexico with respect to Laramide and the ability to operate. As you know, we have our Crown Point property that has, uh, uh, we, we have significant control of the, the minerals at Crown Point where you've got, where there's a need to work together with Laramide because we, we have parallel interests there or, or overlapping interest. And I would say that the folks at Laramide are great. And uh, I've known Mark Henderson for quite a while and some of the people who work under him, I have a lot of respect for them. And I think that there's going to be a place where we'll be able to work together uh, on particularly developing Crown Point. Uh, but uh, the, we both benefit from uh, the strategy that we're talking about, which is working in the local communities, trying to get that social license. I, I used to work for Uranium Resources back in the, the late 80s and early 90s, or through the mid 90s. And uh, uh, the... Uh, one of the things we did was we spent a heck of a lot of money in New Mexico licensing and permitting. Uh, and every time we we went to a hearing and everything, it was always the legacy issues that showed up and, and the fact that uh, people wanted needed more assurance uh, than just a, a few jobs in the community. I think Laramide recognized recognize that they've got a couple of people that, that to do work for them that have went through that, that uh, uh, history. And I think that gives us both a, an opportunity to be able to uh, deliver. And the New Mexico's got great resources, you know, and they fit our our profile of looking at in situ first. Uh, and uh, and so I, I just see a, the opportunity there, but it's gonna take some work. It's gonna take some time and some work and patience. I do believe we will be successful there. Yeah, you guys have a pretty good team in that regard there. And then also just your experience um, in the U.S., you've got a lot of tribe experience as well. And so, again, capability here is taking those boxes. And I think you guys have ticked a lot of those. And I think you guys will continue to progress those in a reasonable manner to uh, to gain you know social support, which is so key to start at the local level and then work your way up from back up to the county, state level, et cetera. Well, Paul, let's switch gears here. Let's go back to the uh, the corporate uh, high level corporate side. Can you just maybe update us after the financing? Update us on the capital structure here, and then if you can uh, share any uh, major shareholders at this point. 
I'll answer the, the last one first. I, Bill Sheriff would be the one to be closer to know the, uh, the, the major shareholders. We have some good, loyal, uh, I would say significant shareholders, and uh, some of whom participate in that most recent financing that have a lot of support for us. But the, as far as the details on that, I don't have those details. I apologize for that. As far as our capital structure, I believe our, and I'm going off memory right now because I don't have it sitting in front of me, but of approximately 195 million outstanding shares. And I think we have a total of 224 million fully diluted or, you know, after the, the private placement. So I think our share structure is pretty well. We've got a few warrants out that haven't been exercised, but most of those are in the money now and uh, as well as a few options as well. So, you know, that'll be when those get exercised, we'll get some more revenue coming into the company. So. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but I did my best. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. And I know that there's at least two major institutions there, you know, obviously one of them being Power One Capital, uh, which is, yeah. is there is a strong one uh, major shareholder that, of course, is not uh, reporting, but uh, nonetheless, a, a pretty significant and important partner on that front. Now, at one point, I don't know when it was, but uh, Sachem Cove Partners was listed as a major shareholder. They're not there anymore as listed as a major shareholder, but do you care? Well, obviously, you know, I have a lot of respect for Mike and Tim. Having their support is always a good thing. So, it, yeah, I say I do care because I just respect those guys. But it's not, we don't see it, you know, from my perspective, whether, you know, they have their own investment uh, decisions they make and where they want to put their money. And obviously they've made, we, I believe they've made good money on their investment in Encore, particularly over the last, you know, since uh, last fall or late summer, you know, well advised to take those profits. So, but uh, do we need them going forward? You know, it's really up to them. Uh, I think that we're, we're okay where we're at and, and where we go forward. But, uh, you know, I go back to that story about, uh, you know, wanting to prove yourself and, you know, needing to, to demonstrate results. I think if we, when Encore is act, we're actually showing that, you know, Although I've been able to demonstrate we are executing on our plans, but show that the, the results of that execution, I think that uh, we may see them become, you know, maybe they'll become more visible, et cetera. I just don't know. Uh, but uh, like I said, I got I got a lot of respect for those guys. Uh, they have they're true believers in the area markets, and uh, I've had an opportunity to spend time with them. And you have to earn their, you know, I want to earn their ownership if they choose to. Absolutely. There's a lot of factors to that. You know, whether it's Smith Weekly owns shares of a company or has recommended a company or it's uh, Sachem Cove or Sprott, any of these other companies. And I have respect for all of these groups, certainly for Mike and Tim. No secret there, obviously. But just because they're not listed on a roster, it's, it's irrelevant. It really is because, number one, there may not be a reporting requirement. They may be a shareholder and don't have to report. You don't know what size they have. Mm -hmm. it, to me, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter just because you know it's not recommended by Smith Weekly doesn't mean it's not a bad, a good or bad company. It doesn't mean anything. So the the right. whole point of oh well we got this this and this that doesn't matter. Uh, obviously, there's a disagree. Uh, Power One still a shareholder. So oh, yeah. to me, Paul, I don't go out and look for a brand name on a share roster to make my decisions. I don't agree with half the stuff the Sprott does. Are they a good capital allocator? Absolutely. But do I agree with everything they do? Absolutely not. So yeah. if you're just scanning shareholder rosters in this sector, you're not doing enough. You're doing yourself a disservice. And no disrespect to any of them, but just because they're not on there or they're not talking about the company doesn't mean anything to me. You got to dig deeper. Yeah. You have to bring in a lot of components. There's a lot of pieces and parts to this. I remember yeah. the days when Encore was two cents, two and a half cents. Matter of fact, I had it. I owned it. Again, there's lots of different components there. You know, we'll see. We'll see at the end how this all comes together. These horses and jockeys are still banging around in the gates inside the stalls. Uh, the yeah. race has barely started, and the finish line is a long ways away. And how each of these companies performs to that finish line, because we're all going to be able to witness it as long as we're still alive, we're going to be able to see how this all ends. And so I think people uh, need to be careful about just going around and well, if, you know, if Sage and Cove doesn't own it, uh, you know, we better not touch it, you know, or Smith Weekly doesn't own it, we better not touch it, or Sprott or any of these other companies, Power One, et cetera. Take that with what it is. Right. Yeah, you know, come on. So 
I want to talk about a listing for a moment. You guys are still TSXV listed. Market cap's up there. I think it's uh, around the 200 million threshold, roughly Canadian. What's your thoughts on potentially uplisting to TSX or the NYSE Amex? You know, when do you think that's prudent? What are you guys planning on that front, Paul? First of all, we, we're evaluating the opportunity to do that, uh, to uh, uh, basically get on a, you know, move to a major board. Probably we see the opportunity by moving to a U.S. major trading platform because, you know, it gives us that ability to to uh, reach those, uh, that shareholder base, it's, which is much larger. Uh, so we, we're evaluating those. Uh, we hope to have something, you know, moving that direction, hopefully this calendar year, but uh, it's really going to depend on one, on, on where the equity stands, what we have to do to qualify. You know, there's, there's a, uh, there's a benchmark you have to meet to, to uh, get onto those exchanges. And it's not something that happens overnight. It takes a lot of work. And so whether it's TSX or NYSE uh, or even NASDAQ, it's going to take some effort to to make those moves, but it's definitely we we see that as our next step. That's uh, our 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 next graduation point, so to speak. Uh, we definitely have that built into our plans. I just don't have any sense of time. I, nothing I can do on a sense of timing right now, uh, but uh, it's definitely something we've been working on internally to make that to get to that point where we can make that decision. Hopefully, we'll be able to do something on with respect to. If we're successful in some of these M and A work and everything to make that happen uh, as a as a as a mechanism to get there, but uh, obviously we're going to continue to pursue with our current plans, and uh, that's one of the things we see down the road. The sweet spot to me seems to be in watching this sector a lot and studying a lot of these companies, not necessarily in the uranium space, you know, over in the other sectors as well within the natural resource business, is you know the 500 million market cap area. Is, is kind of the entry level to me for the Amex mm -hmm. listing um, on the New York Stock Exchange. I think that level is roughly where you want to be, obviously, in an earlier part of, of the cycle, of course. And so I think that that is, to me, the area that you want to go. And then, you know, if you're a domicile company in Canada, you know, the TSX makes sense to have that as well. So having that dual listing, I think that makes sense because we've seen a lot of rewarding coming out of the, the earlier stage, you know, these companies like Energy Fuels, UEC, you know, you are energy, the liquidity that they have on these exchanges, uh, you know, certainly is helpful coming out of the gate here. But I, I like that. I'm glad you guys are looking at that. That is important as we go here. And to do it relatively earlier in the cycle, I think, makes a lot of sense rather than doing it towards the end. On another topic here, Paul, hypothetical scenario, uranium is 55 a pound today. The company has decided to produce and sell into spot at Rosita. Maybe there's a long-term contract, but for this example, uh, that doesn't matter. How long would it take for that first cake in a can? And then what approximate total cost per pound? If you can give us just a ballpark, I know that you can't give us an exact figure, but what do you think there would be a reasonable goal on cost? Assuming that uranium was 55, as we're talking right now today, what's the time frame, and what do you guys think your cost would be? So our time frame, assuming all the sales are, all the wind is in our sails and, and uh, the, the creeks are running, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are, you know, we're shooting to be at the point where we can deliver, or produce yellow cake in a can in 2023 by mid 2023. Uh, now that's assuming everything goes in the right direction and everything happens as we expect it to. Obviously, a lot of things go there. Their market has to be there, et cetera. But let's assume in the $55 per pound market. Uh, and uh, assuming we move forward with these projects based on, without having a PEA, I can't give you precise numbers, but I'm going off my experience. We believe our costs will be below $40 per pound all in. And that's uh, depending on who's qualifying it, et cetera. But that would be everything except for, say, corporate costs and SG&A. Uh, but uh, it would include royalty, taxes, uh, sustaining capital, well-field, you know, sustaining well-field capital, operating costs, et cetera. So we see that everything but the, for lack of a better word, except for head office cost. So that'd be somewhere just under $40 a pound. That's what my expectation is based on what the, uh, the geology and everything I'm seeing and based on some of the, the data we've got on leachability testing. I, I think that might be Probably a conservative number, but I, that's a number I'm willing to 
say, yeah, pretty close to that. And, you know, it's like I said, it's not going to be, it's, uh, well, I didn't say it before, but it's not Kazakh numbers, but uh, I believe it's competitive numbers right now. And if you look at, you know, Trade Tech puts out uh, what they call their production cost index, or in, which is an incentive, you know, what they say that worldwide cost is being. And right now, this at the end of March, they moved that up to $43 a pound, which is what the, they say the average production cost is around the world. Uh, to for new production to to increase production so i think we're in a ballpark i think we're below that ballpark and we may be lower maybe better but uh, i'd rather rather not speculate too much until i get a better handle on what the economics are well i think your experience qualifies well here if you guys had to accelerate if you had the capital and you could accelerate do you, do you really see that you guys could do this in 18 20 months yeah we do i do Okay. That's, you know, there, there's some permitting work has to be done because you're, you're bringing on new wealth fields and all that stuff. But I, I that's pretty well defined. You know, the license or the, the radioactive material licenses that are already in place, that's usually the, the long pole in the tent that holds everything up. Uh, that's already done. So it's just a matter of just expanding those license areas to, to new production. And I think that I, I think it's pretty well controlled. I think uh, if you look at Texas, go back and look what, what uh, our competitor UEC has done. They've been on track with their permitting and everything, and I don't see us deviating too far from what their timelines have been. Paul, if you guys are able to get these production centers going in Texas, however that is, whether they're combined or whatever happens, if you guys are able to squeeze maximum production out of what these units offer right now, maybe with some expansion work, and of course with some of your, let's call it the gorns and tweaks to the uh, operational capabilities here, what do you think you guys can squeeze out of these production centers? Uh, right now, I'm going to say about 2 million pounds a year between the two of them. And the reason why, the little limiting factor is the drying capacity. The processing capacity that Rosita right now has capability of doing about 1.5 million, but it's, it's an easy, easy lift. It's a matter of adding two tanks to it to do, get to 2 million pounds of production capacity, but where the limitation sits is in drying capacity. And that's the packaging. That's actually to create the yellow cake drums. And so uh, uh, we would have to expand drying capacity. But the easy thing is, is that we can just take one from Kingsville and move it over there. It's fairly, it's really modular. And also, you could just take one off the shelf. The guys who who did the work at Rosita back in 2008 and at Kingsville have set it up to where you can easily double drying capacity without any significant issues. And the licenses are built around that. And so. Right now, I would say that if if we had, uh, you know, everything was working in our favor and we had the, you know, I was able to expand the resource base to support it, I believe we could do two million pounds a year. Excellent. And following on to this, Paul, just kind of along the same type of scenario here, would you guys do a mix of opportunistic spot selling? Uh, given the current potential production profile that you mentioned, would you guys look at a little bit of opportunistic spot selling and would you possibly mix that with some long-term contracting to lock in some of that baseline for the company? Yes, and and I'll qualify that more now. Uh, the uh, with respect to term contracts and everything, I see those as be ba effectively base loading or supporting the minimum, you know, whatever we need to maintain our production. Not necessarily at the top end, but to to create that. There's a, always every uranium operation has a threshold point where it goes. You go from, say, an operating cost of sub twenty dollars, let's say sub fifteen dollars, to a point where you're over twenty dollars a pound, and it's a fairly fine line. We want to keep our our base demand, the the revenue source, at that point. So typically, it's about that fifty percent uh, production capacity of uh, the facility that uh, where you get that break point, and uh, that's where your fixed costs are, are no longer weighting down the uh, the total operating cost. We would. I want to ba effectively base load the the fixed costs of my uh, production through term contracts, and then uh, use the upside uh, exposure to the spot market. And there are a couple of ways one could do that. One could have a basically a spot uh, indexed uh, offtake agreement, or you could just do it directly in the spot market. I have done both, and it's just a matter of uh, kind of what terms are there and everything else. But I, you know, I. You, you'll get rewarded by having long-term contracts to support the economics of your project, but you, if you don't have the ability to see some exposure to upside, you don't you you get punished for that as well. 
but I'm not looking at it from a reward punishment part of it. I'm looking at it from an economics part of it. And when I worked at for a company called Mustang Uranium, which was a privately held company, we had a mix of both and we were very successful with it. And I see that going forward here too. And it keeps you from being too exposed to one pricing mechanism versus another. Well, that's uh, no pun intended. That's about spot on, Paul. That's what uh, I think makes a pretty good amount of sense there. So uh, I think you've got that set up just about right. Well, let's uh, let's talk just a little bit expansion on the pipeline here. Going back to the scenario, so Rosita's going. Um, that's the initial shot in the arm for production for the company. What would be the second asset that the company has now? What would be the second place you guys would focus on for potential next development and production? Boy, that's a good question. So as you know, the, the New Mexico side is our, our long term. It, a lot of it depends on various factors, but our, as long as we're working, you know, New Mexico is heading in the right direction, I would begin to look uh, at uh, potential doing something up in Wyoming with our current properties we have or some opportunities there. Uh, that's kind of, that's that's like the three to four year window. And then beyond that is uh, the, the New Mexico side, of, assuming, you know, we're making progress there, but I see our strategy in Texas growing. Uh, I see a lot of upside there. Uh, so we got Rosita and et cetera going, but I, I would see increasing satellite capacity, satellite production into Rosita and Kingsville, uh, and then upsizing the, the production capacities of those two facilities as being the short term or the midterm type, the next step uh, to maximize that. But also I would look to another jurisdictional jump and I'm focusing, I'm talking strictly about in situ recovery. I'm not talking about conventional mining right at the moment. Uh, I see the opportunity sitting out there, you know, uh, is, is New Mexico and then and Wyoming as being the next opportunities. Conventional, we, we still have significant conventional assets. Those are going to be based on what, what works. And, uh, but right now, our strategy is ISR first to focus on those resources rather than spending a lot of cap the company's capital on conventional projects, which uh, still must be leveraged to some kind of milling capacity. Correct. And I think that's important to have that as well for you guys to have that conventional checkbox, both of them. And obviously they have their place in the strategy, which I think is pretty clear with your company. Just going on to that here with the increase in uranium equity prices, has that made it more difficult to acquire new projects in the U.S. because of obviously one valuation and two, some of these beaten down prides and egos and really demolished people that just want to get out of the sector with the increase that's happened now that these people are starting to get a little bit more optimistic? Has that increased the difficulty to do project acquisition? It has has certainly created some challenges. So. Yeah, I'll just give you kind of a uh, an obtuse example. You know, you know, there's some assets that uh, you know that we looked at that were owned by somebody else, and and uh, by the time we put our offer in and and uh, the the equities were taken off, it becomes much more difficult to to stay uh, within something you know with a cost that's reasonable, but also the expectations change dramatically. And it does create those, you know, when I talk about expectations, and uh, that's where some of the egos fall in. And, uh, well, maybe I don't need you guys. Uh, maybe we can do this on our own, et cetera. That's going to take a little time to percolate through. I, I would say that it's everything, you know, our valuation went up along with everybody else's valuation up. So the numbers get bigger, but uh, the, 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 the hit, the, the bottom line impact is, uh, it's probably going to be about equivalent. It's just going to be able to get to terms that have bigger numbers, more numbers to the left of the decimal place uh, and millions of dollars in valuation to get there because simply the equity prices have changed. Even if you're looking at purchasing something on the outright as a from a private holder, uh, the fact that the equity prices have moved uh, also makes the that uh, more expensive. You can't just go claim poverty and get something on the on the cheap, you have to be a little bit more judicious on how you go about messaging. But uh, I, has it precluded opportunities? No, but it's just made it more difficult to get to a point where, you know, as long as valuations continue to move up on the equity side, it becomes more difficult to uh, set a point where everybody feels like it's it's amicable. Yeah, absolutely agreed. I think that's what is starting to happen here. And 
I think you and I both also agree that this is still generally rounding errors. You know, in the big picture here, it still has a lot of value to be had. That should be encouraging still, not discouraging. And then the other part that you said, in looking back at, at on-course performance, all equities have gone up in valuation, but on-core has gone up more. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly from the two and a half cent level that I remember, but d- definitely a, a interesting set of circumstances here. And let me just, before we wrap up, let me just follow on to this. At this level, do you think that the optimism drops off again? The equities come back down. Maybe we form a higher low and that there is still a potential window later this year and maybe into early 2022? Or do you think that this is uh, pretty much in the history books? No, I I think that uh, we're going to, you know, two months ago, I would have said uh, that uh, uh, I would have expected a pullback on on equities and that would have made things a little bit more rational. But I think what we've done now is basically it's we've shifted to where we're basically creating a whole new uh, point of uh, you know, support level. So I think that uh, now we just have to establish terms that are at these levels going forward. And I think there's still opportunities. I certainly don't see it as being foreclosed on by any stretch yet, but it, it just resets that baseline uh, and expectation. You know, there's always opportunity for upside, but I think there might be some, and I could be wrong, you know, everything, the whims of anything changes, but uh you know, I think that right now we've just got a base support where, where current respective uh, evaluations are, and, and we'll just have to work from that level going forward. Higher highs and higher lows here, I think, Paul, and uh, mm-hmm. we'll see what happens next. But again, splitting hairs a bit and certainly rounding hairs still. Uh, there's still a lot of value yeah. to be here, and it's still early stage. But like you said, I think that the window is very, very short to being closed here. And as optimism rises, and some of these CEOs that were beaten down over the years are now thinking that, yes, we can do this on our own. And they've uh, closed up shop as well. So we'll see what happens yeah. here over the next, I think the next 10 months or so will be pretty critical. Well, to wrap up, uh, for potential investors who are on the sidelines listening in the audience, Paul, market cap of the company stands around 200 million Canadian today. What would you say to them at this stage and at current price levels? Why should they consider Encore Energy now? You know, Encore provides a, a significant uh, future upside. We're just getting started. That's the what we see right now is that we we haven't been forced to have significant holding cost and and corporate costs for several years. We've been working on a cheap, uh, keeping things our costs as low as possible, and so we don't we're not burdened our our capital structure and our opportunities aren't burdened by just carrying on legacies going forward. That we have where we it allows us to be more nimble and more opportunistic and i would like to just characterize it as i think there's a whole lot of more opportunity going forward and the best is yet to come and paul best way for investors to reach out to you and the company so you can go to the website uh there's contact information on the website info at encoreenergycorp.com but they can email me directly at p Gorenson at EncoreEnergyCorp.com. And certainly I'll do my best to be as responsive as possible. But if they want to reach us by phone, there's a contact number to call and and then we can follow up on that. Paul, it's always a pleasure. Good to chat. Always uh, fun to talk the market here and to catch up and looking forward to you guys keeping up the good work, keeping up the efforts. You guys definitely seem to be motivated here uh, to drive ahead while others are still trying to figure out what they're going to do. So Appreciate that and and looking forward to chatting again soon. Good to have you on. Sure. I enjoyed it. Thanks for this opportunity and, and look forward to our next time to talk.